Okay, let me turn it on. So now we're recording. Welcome everybody. Um, we're so glad to have you here. Good afternoon or good morning for some of you. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy, hopefully not too stressful day to join us for this HealthLinks webinar. Um, we are here to talk about something I'm sure you can all relate to, <laughs> taking charge of stress in the workplace. My name is Alexis Terrell and I'm the Continuing Education Manager for HealthLinks. And to get us started today, I'm gonna give you a few housekeeping items. And I would like to make sure that all of you have a pen and paper as we move through the webinar, that will help you. You'll be asked to stop and reflect at a few points. So be sure to go ahead and grab that. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, the HealthLinks program and the HealthLinks benchmarks, you know there may, you may know there are six. And today's webinar specifically deals with creating health policies and programs. Part of our goal for the HealthLinks program is to connect businesses to each other and to valuable resources to help you create a culture of health, safety, and well-being for employees. So for those who aren't familiar with HealthLinks, there'll be some contact information at the end to help connect you with more resources. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would just like to let you all know that um, all of our attendees are kept on mute throughout the duration of the presentation. So don't worry about what's happening in your background. <laughs> uh, we won't hear it. If you do have a question, simply use the Q&A box. You should see that on the control panel on your screen. You could use the chat box as well. We will reserve time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, but feel free to go ahead and type or uh, write down your questions when they come to you so you don't forget it, and then we'll get to them at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll send you a link to find it and share it on our YouTube channel after the presentation is over with. Um, in that follow-up email, besides the link to the uh, webinar recording, we'll also give you an opportunity to provide feedback. So if there are similar topics or other questions related to stress in the workplace you'd like to learn about, you can let us know there. And in that follow-up email as well, you'll have the opportunity to um, request SHRM credits and to claim that code if you are looking for uh, additional continuing education. Now for the fun part. So today's presenter is Cynthia Lackner. She is a psychotherapist in private practice in the Denver area who actually helps people of all ages, not only in Denver, but across the country, actually across the world, in dealing with stress, anxiety, depression, addiction issues, basically generalized anxiety issues of all kinds. Cynthia is a certified emotional brain training provider, and she was trained at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, and she's a certified mental health integrative medicine provider. For the past 17 years, Cynthia Lackner has created, co-produced, designed, facilitated, taught, and implemented programs and workshops that help people examine their lives learn skills and tools to diminish stress and make changes toward living a life focused on thriving rather than just existing. And in her motto, true health is not the absence of disease, it's about the presence of vitality and a sense of purpose. So without further ado, um, let, I'm gonna let uh, Cynthia share her screen and we'll get started with the webinar. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy that you're all on with me today. So this is called Take Charge of Stress in the Workplace. Let's try that again. Yeah, so um, did you click share your screen, Cynthia? Yes. Um, it still wants me to share mine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So click it one more time. 
Okay. How's that? Is everybody seeing that? Perfect. Now we're good to go. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, you know technology, and that's always stressful, right? So that's perfect that that happened. <laughs> it's an opportunity to have a stressful moment. All right, so now um, I'm trying to move ahead here. Uh, let's see, now what's happening? Okay. Is there an arrow at the bottom of your screen you can click? Um, looking for that. Maybe at the bottom of your slide. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. Oh my goodness. No worries. And is your, is your um, arrow key working? Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, or maybe your enter key? Or return? Yeah, that's not working either uh, for some reason. Okay, so let me go out of here. All right, so let's just start. Can you all see this still? Yes. Okay, let's just do it this way. Um, should I try start slideshow again or just go from here? Um, if you'd like to, you can start slideshow. Okay, let's work. Give, let's go back. All right, let's see if this works. Here we go. Now, perfect. Okay, so learning outcomes, in addition to uh, technology issues here, learn the root cause of stress and how your body and brain are negatively impacted. Become self-aware using the five-point stress brain state test that we're all gonna take in a few minutes. Take away a solid understanding of the different brain states and how to reframe your interactions with difficult coworkers bullies, supervisors, and bosses. Evaluate your communication skills with others at home and at work. And objectives for the webinar. So what are you hoping to learn from today's session? What stress-related problems that are impacting me are solvable? How to remain aware of my brain state on a daily basis? so I can feel more calm and productive throughout the day. How to use cycles and other tools to diminish stress. Implement new communication skills to manage issues with coworkers, supervisors, and bosses. And finally, perhaps skills to evaluate if you are the difficult person. We'll go over all of that today. The webinar agenda is root causes of stress and how those causes can become anxiety, depression, and addiction. Identify physical ailments that are, that are manifestations of stress. Mind-body connection and illness. Learn new communication skills that will help with difficult work and personal relationships. Review of basics and next steps. So the American Medical Association has identified stress as the number one cause of all human illness and disease. So stress can absolutely kill. Stress not only makes us feel awful emotionally, it can also exacerbate just about any health condition you can possibly think of. Stress increases the rate in which our cell diseases, such as heart disease and diabetes. When we get stressed, even the smallest stressful incidents can damage our bodies for up to two hours afterwards. It's no secret that repeated and sustained stress can wreak havoc on our bodies, inside and out, head to toe. In fact, the top 10 causes of death around the world can either be set in motion or accelerated by stress. Stress can lower or even halt your feel-good hormones, ultimately leaving you feeling flat, exhausted, and depressed.
Dr. Jay Winner, Family Medicine Founder and Director of the Stress Reduction Program for the Sansum Clinic, Santa Barbara, California, says, high cortisol also impairs immune function and makes it harder to fight off infections. In addition, cortisol increases blood sugar levels and boosts the risks of type 2 diabetes. Research also shows that chronic stress makes us reach for comfort foods, contributing to the growing obesity epidemic. Stress is also a trigger for tension and migraine headaches, along with anxiety, depression, and it contributes to gastrointestinal problems like irritable bowel syndrome, heartburn, and acid reflux. So chronic stress can lead to any of the following health risks, heart disease, high blood pressure, allergies, asthma, autoimmune disorders, recurrent colds, gastrointestinal problems, colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, infertility, ED, insomnia, depression, anxiety, diabetes, migraine headaches, and chronic pain. Why people downplay the impact of stress? Well, because people treat stress like a badge of honor. People think relaxation is akin to laziness. If we're relaxing, we must not be working hard enough. Doctors get little or no training in stress-related conditions. Doctors usually prescribe a pill that only masks the symptoms of stress. And pills only address the symptoms, not the source of the stress has a presence in our lives like never before. Our schedules are completely maxed out. We are mentally overstimulated by new information. Coming from all angles all day long, our bodies are bombarded by a deluge of toxins. We are chronically fatigued because we don't get enough time to sleep, rest, and just be. Consider this. Stress is defined as a real or imagined threat to your body or ego. These mental and physical impacts add up, and they're not unconnected. That means the negative beliefs and emotions that you hold like never being able to live up to your spouse's expectations or feeling inadequate at work can create stress in the body. They both get your stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol pumping that can both raise your heart rate, affect brain's memory center, increase belly fat, and send signals throughout that things are just not okay. If this becomes the norm for you, your health is in big trouble. Unfortunately, emotions are often dismissed. During the conversation around stress, we need to dig deeper into the heart to understand what emotional stress is holding us back. So a big component of stress are addictions. One in seven of us struggle with food, alcohol, opioids, stimulants, technology, or other behavioral addictions. In emotional brain training, which is the modality that I use mostly, we see addiction as not being a disease, but actually a brain wire. Many people who struggle with addiction feel isolated. If anything, substances are used when the aspect of loneliness becomes unbearable. The opposite of addiction is not not abusing a substance. It is feeling that connection to others, not feeling that unbearable loneliness. Typically, when discussing with a patient about their concerns, such as their anger, their sadness, and their fear, what typically comes up for them 
is feeling like whatever they do is just not good enough. Either they feel that others judge them that way or they themselves feel this way. Without addressing the root cause of these issues, they spend their life numbing out with external solutions. Another aspect of feeling I am not enough is the powerful hindrance of our resilience is the feeling of shame. Shame is an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. Shame erodes the part of ourselves that believes we are capable of change. We cannot change or grow when we are in shame. Shame is an emotion intrinsic to being a human being. We are hardwired to want to feel safe and to feel loved, to belong and to be accepted. The profound of feeling of not having that in our lives can lead to self-medication. It can look like excessive food, alcohol, drugs, porn, anything at all to numb that intense emotional pain. Awareness and support of emotional processing can make a difference between merely surviving and fully thriving. So why allowing ourselves to be emotional is actually healthy for us is important. In our culture, emotions are often seen as a nuisance, something to just get over with or get around. Even worse, having emotions other than a select few positively associated ones are seen as actually a weakness, something that we should be ashamed of and must work hard to conceal. Emotions are the key to a fully developed brain and a fully realized life. Emotional literacy is as important as teaching reading, writing, and math to our kids. If we model healthy emotional expression, our children will learn to do it as well. This can mean identifying frustration, expressing nervousness, and insecurity when it bubbles up. And not say instead, I'm fine when we are worried or mad or no longer waiting to shed tears when alone. Living our emotional life out loud does not mean always revealing the adult material behind the woes. We can still express our sadness, our anxiety, our anger, our disappointment or fear without sharing age inappropriate details. So your brain has a set point. The brain set point is determined by all the experiences we've ever had in our life. The more we are in a certain brain state, the more the brain develops the habit of being in that brain state. So the states of stress, so state one, brain state one is, you feel great. You have no cravings for excess. You are creative. You are cooperative. You are loving. You are compassionate. You're full of energy. Brain state two, you feel mostly well, but something is still missing. Ask yourself if you still feel angry, sad, afraid, guilty, tense, tired, hungry, too full, lonely, or sick. Brain state three. This is where we begin to feel a little stressed. Our emotions, especially negative ones, start to increase and our thoughts become more rigid. Brain state four. By this state, we are definitely stressed. We feel needy or distant and disconnected. Finally, brain state five, this state we are stressed out, our brains are wired to be rewarded with unstoppable drives for artificial pleasures. This could be technology, sugar, alcohol, binge watching, television, or binging on unhealthy food when you're not even hungry. All of these are emotional drives. 
we are now going to do an assessment of how much stress you have been experiencing in the last month. I'm going to ask you five questions and you will select a number appropriate to your experience. Please take out the piece of paper that Alexis mentioned and keep track of your score through these next five questions. At the end, I want you to add them up. So the rule is no judgment. This is just for your own information about you, strictly for your awareness. Brain state one, feeling great, feeling balanced and rewarded, the surges of pleasure in your body. Give yourself a zero for rarely, one for sometimes, two for often, three for very often. Brain state two, feeling good, being present and aware of your balanced positive and negative feelings. Give yourself a zero for rarely, one for sometimes, two for often, three for very often. Brain state three, now you're feeling a little stressed, feeling mainly negative feelings being somewhat numb and thinking too much, like ruminating. Give yourself a three for rarely, two for sometimes, one for often, zero for very often. Brain stay four, definitely stressed, feeling negative and unbalanced feelings, having expectations that are too harsh. Give yourself a three for rarely, two for sometimes, one for often, zero for very often. And finally, brain state five. Stressed out, overwhelmed, confused, lost or disconnected. Give yourself a three for rarely, two for sometimes, one for often, and zero for very often. I want you to add those up. If you have 12 to 15, it just means that in the last month you haven't had that much stress. If you were really honest with yourself, the way you answered this. Or you perhaps were between nine and 11, six to eight, three to five, or zero to two. I've worked with people that have zeros that come up, which just means they're incredibly stressed and they need to learn a few skills. So again, the higher the score, the better you're feeling. That's all this was telling you. So emotions we feel in our body. There's grief, fear, anger, shame, sadness, vulnerability, and disappointment. As you learn more about yourself, you will notice that these are certain feelings that you feel in your body even more sometimes than you feel in your mind. So now I'm going to go over a tool with you called cycles. So the first thing you would think of is something that's really upsetting you, possibly at work. And you would write down the situation is and then what I'm the most upset about. And this can change hourly and daily, and you do this every single time you're upset. So what are cycles? Well, cycles help you access your emotions, your unmet expectations. Those unmet expectations keep us the most upset. So they they can be, I feel angry that, and let your brain do all the work. See what bubbles up. I feel sad that. I feel afraid that. I feel guilty that. So one feeling melts into the other. This is a natural process. These are stress circuits. I feel that way because my unreasonable expectation is one of the following. 
I do not exist. I am bad. I am not perfect. I have no power. I cannot do well. I cannot love. I am not worthy. And last, I cannot have joy. These stress circuits come up when we get triggered. The opposite of those is a reasonable expectation, which could be, I do exist. I am not bad. I don't have to be perfect to be wonderful. I do have power. I can do well. I can love. I am worthy. I can have joy. So we need to do a deeper dive into emotional brain training. It interprets your cycle results over time. You can diagnose and recognize where your patterns come from, usually from your childhood. Determine whether your unmet expectations are reasonable, which expectations were fueling your stress. Work up your uniquely powerful positive thought like I am worthy or I can love or I In this situation with this difficult coworker or this challenging boss, I can do the best that I can in this situation. You have learned some of the tools, and again, this is just a quick overview, that you can use to sharpen your awareness of your body's reactions to stress and to use cycles to work through stressful situations and relax your brain state to a calmer, more manageable level. The difference between emotional brain training and other modalities is the rewiring of the emotional brain. Part one of this webinar was discussing brain states and tools like a cycle that we just went over. Part two is going to examine the question how does one improve communications with others, especially bosses, supervisors, and challenging coworkers? The truth is, we need to protect ourselves from emotional attacks. When someone verbally attacks us, circuits in our brain get downloaded. These circuits often have a lot of emotional memory. Sometimes it feels like an ouch like someone standing with cleats on our heart. What can activate stress the most is when we feel judged. The reason communication can be so difficult is thinking about things that trigger, fight, flight, and freeze, coming from the reptilian brain. When we are in a five brain state, we feel overwhelmed, scared, angry, or sad. Hearing messages can often trigger us. The awareness of this is so important. So how does one improve communication with others? So what brain state do you think they are in? And your brain state. So now that you can begin to discern, and you're new at this, but what brain state you're in, the next step is to see if you can just imagine, try to figure out what brain state could someone else be in. If you are honest with yourself and you're in that lizard brain and you're stressed, it's just not gonna go so well. If you're in a brain state angry that, sad that, afraid that, guilty that, see what comes up for you. Again, your brain state 
and then see if you can come up with something called compassion. Can you create in your mind compassion for the other person? Can you ask yourself, what is my intention for this conversation? If your brain state is offline and you're in that reptilian brain, you cannot create compassion for that other person. So with challenging people, we want to escape from them or prove our point and change their opinion. We want to punish them. We want to get away from them. We want to change them. So avoiding conflict in the workplace doesn't make it better. It produces even more stress. Just think about that. It creates problems and small issues become something even bigger. Toxic feelings are more prevalent. A sense of dread is more common. Conflict avoidance can be worse than hostility toward one another. Often people want to be authentic, but have deep fears and avoid taking risks for fear of repercussions. So now I want you to take out that piece of paper again, or a different piece of paper, and I want you to write down the name of a person who causes you stress in the workplace. I'll give you a minute to think of someone. I have a feeling you might have that idea right, right there. You might have that person in mind. Can you see how your choice of avoiding conflict is self-protective? and keeps you stuck and disengaged? What beliefs and passive behaviors have occurred that keeps you from getting your needs met? What would help you to tolerate more emotional intensity? If you can tolerate some tension and stay with a substantial issue from beginning to end, instead of disengaging from it, it will be challenging, and yet it can also be a pathway to enormous progress. So in terms of communication, try approaching a difficult topic from their perspective. Try to see how he or she would view the topic and start with your understanding of how he or she feels. Read their body language. If that first step is going reasonably well, gently offer your view. If you appear to be coming from a place of compassion for their point of view instead of hostility, you could possibly make headway. People can tell when there is rage and anger just underneath the surface. Demonstrating compassion and understanding helps people to begin to soften and sometimes begin to see another view. So the goal is to envision yourself at a brain state one. And I know I've gone over so much information today but the goal will always be to calm and soothe yourself to get to brain state one. You can be in all five brain states throughout the day. You could even be starting your day in a brain state two where you're feeling pretty good, get in the car, driving to work, and someone tries to cut you off. All of a sudden, you're in a brain state five. It can happen very quickly. There is no problem in being in those brain states we just don't want to stay in a five brain state. That's why I mentioned the cortisol before. Or even there's this wonderful book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And it's because when a lion is running after a zebra, a zebra isn't like a human and, and ruminates and freaks out and thinks about it and tells his husband or wife later about the day he had. It, it hides. It wasn't someone's lunch. And now it's feeling better about its day. People aren't like that. 
they get stuck in that five brain state. And if they don't have the skills or tools to get out of that brain state, unfortunately, they stay in that brain state. And as the day goes on and on, they are, it just fans the flames and they're now more aggravated and more upset than ever. So again, if you can come up with compassion for that other person, that can make the relationship tolerable. Just think about that next time when you have to have a difficult you know, connection to someone or a difficult conversation with someone. So you have learned some of the tools that you can use to sharpen your awareness of your body's reaction to stress and to use cycles to work through stressful situations while relaxing your brain state to a calmer, more manageable level. So therapists like me can work with you in deeper detail so that you can take control of your stress levels and use these skills daily for the rest of your life. A famous therapist recently was asked, does everyone need therapy? And she, the therapist responded, not everyone needs therapy, but everyone can benefit from therapy. So it's not difficult to learn the skills and tools of emotional brain training. It is difficult to live with stress. So now I would like to just stop for a minute and see if there are any questions that have come up. So I had a question, Cynthia. Okay. Well, I, I was kind of wondering what would happen if, like, what's the harm if stress is ignored in the workplace? Okay, that's a great question. And I feel um, from what I've read, this may, maybe we'll be able to answer it. So 34% of U.S. workers report losing one hour a day due to stress. So if they've had issues at home that they weren't able to solve, they bring them to work, or vice versa. And it's just really hard to let go of those issues at home or issues at work and leave them there. So it makes sense that an hour a day could be lost due to stress. And another uh, example of that is 72% of those asked say it interferes with their lives and performance, which I think is a huge number. Yeah, that's pretty startling. Yes, that's absolutely true. I just wanted to see if there were any more questions. I know I've thrown out a lot of information here. Yeah, for those who want to ask questions, you can click. There's a box. Um, usually it's either on the bottom or the top of your Zoom uh, screen. There's a control bar with a Q&A box. If you do want to ask a question, you can click there or, or just submit it right in the chat box. And while we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, um, I'm happy to, um, to, sh to well, well, we'll save that for another minute. <laughs> I was just going to announce that um, next month's webinar will be about nurturing resilience with self-care. So a good segue to um, topics of, of taking care of our emotional well-being. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that would be a good one to follow this, this webinar. So here's a question. Um, what are some of the best quick ways to battle stress during the workday? Like maybe practices that take five or 10 minutes, um, if you can, especially if you can't get away from your desk to take a walk or something like that. Do you have any suggestions, Cynthia? I do, I do, that's perfect. And I want everyone to deal with me right now because we have a few minutes. I want you to sit up nice and tall in your chairs. I assume you're sitting in a chair. I want your shoulders back. I want your eyes closed. I want your hand on your stomach. And I want you to do that diaphragmatic breathing, the kind of breathing you do if you're taking a Pilates class or a yoga class. And I want you to breathe in through your nose and out through your 
here now, if I've had attorneys even do this sitting in court. I work with a lot of attorneys. I work with a lot of doctors that in between patients, they run into their office and they do this. It takes two minutes and you sit there and just sitting up nice and tall with your shoulders back, your eyes closed, and sitting up tall is called body at one. We're trying to get your brain state, as we discussed, to a brain set point of one where you can be calming yourself down and self-soothing without running and eating unhealthy foods like donuts or bagels piled on with cream cheese or potato chips or I'm thinking all the things I used to eat and now you can use other skills and tools to calm yourself. And while your eyes are closed, I want you to scan your body starting at your head and see if you're feeling any tension or pressure in your head and with that nice deep breathing, you're breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth, and you're scanning your body. And if you feel tension or pressure anywhere, you can pretend that you're blowing that nice, calming, soothing breath into those areas of feeling that, that are feeling really tight and tense, like your shoulders, like your chest. A lot of patients tell me their stomach bothers them when they feel stressed. That's because there's a vagus nerve that, that is the longest nerve in the body and ends in the stomach. And that's why a lot of times when you get bad news, your stomach feels sick all of a sudden. That's the vagus nerve that's reacting. And so Lexus, what it does is when you can calm yourself and you have both your feet flat on the floor, you're actually doing a scan of your entire body. And if you have a couple more minutes, you can visualize yourself you know, I'm in Colorado here, so I'm picturing even if I was going down um, in a stream in a boat and I go off, or, off to the side and an embankment and the sun's out and it's warm, I visualize putting all these problems into a boat, all the problems I'm having, all my worries, and then I see them stacked up in my mind and then I watch myself push that boat away. And there's something about that visual that has worked over and over for people to all of a sudden feel calmer and more relaxed and maybe do that right before they have to go in and talk to their boss or their supervisor and then they can feel calmer. And that's something that can take two minutes, not even five minutes. You practice it and you can get really good at it if you even... Um, have just two minutes and you can calm yourself down and then I would do that right before you have to go in and and have a difficult conversation that will get your set point calmer so that you'll be out of a five brain state and I can't guarantee what your boss or supervisor or a co-workers brain state would be in but at least you would be calmer you would come across different and you might have a much more positive outcome with that other person that's, that's great. Um, so Cynthia, another attendee asked, just a follow up to that, when you breathe that way, when you do that deep breathing, why do you yawn so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a great question. It's something that your body tells you that you need more oxygen to the brain. Mm -hmm. So when you yawn, that's exactly what you're doing. But you definitely want to breathe the correct way when we're really stressed out, we're breathing from our chest. And that's why people hyperventilate. When they hyperventilate, they're breathing only from their chest. And that's why they'll say, start breathing from your belly. And so if you can do that, you can calm yourself down. So that is something that you can do. And if you yawn a lot, that's fine. Your brain is giving you a message. I need oxygen up here, struggling. <laughs> Um, so another question, if um, someone wanted to find a therapist, how do you find one that does EBT? And, and sort of along with that, how could you refer staff um, in that direction? Okay, so that's, that's also a really good question. So it's really interesting. Not that many people teach emotional brain training, even though I did learn this modality. And as, I, as you mentioned at the University of California, San Francisco, and there's probably 60 or 70 people, that's all in the whole country that do it. I'm here in Colorado, but I have other people that also teach EBT that I can refer out. I work, um, for example, with groups of people 
uh, and I work one-on-one. -on -one. And here's the great part. Once people learn these skills and tools, I work myself out of a job. It only takes like three to seven times to learn these skills. Now, if you've had trauma or some other issues in your life that come up, naturally you're going to have uh, more time with me, especially if an addiction part comes up. There's no shaming or blaming involved. We're all doing the best we can in this life. But um, that's what I recommend. You can Google ebt.org, and um, that's one way to do it. Otherwise, um, you can contact me. I can recommend other people, or I can certainly t give you a 20-minute free consultation and just see if you feel like I'm a good fit. Otherwise, I have other very good therapists I can recommend that are in the Denver area and all over the country if you want to do something like FaceTime or you know, uh, working on Zoom or whatever, if you're in a group or there's, there's other ways to do it. So I have lots of options for you. Thank you. Um, and we'll be sure to share um, contact information to get in touch with not only health links, but also Cynthia, if you have further questions, um, that'll be on the follow-up email and at the end of the presentation in just a few minutes. But we, we do have another question. Um, okay. um, could you take us through, sort of compare the difference between mindfulness-based mindfulness meditation practice an EMT practice in terms of rewiring the brain? Okay, so, so the rewiring of the brain is the emotional brain training part. And when you asked about mindfulness, mindfulness is phenomenal. So what typically mindfulness does is it just helps you focus on your breath, just like we were doing with that two minute exercise. What I love is that they're a companion piece because you can always do mindfulness where uh, you can learn skills just how to focus on the breath. If you focus on the breath and you think about, oh my gosh, I forgot milk at the grocery store, that comes in and out like a wave. Instead of getting annoyed with yourself going, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just thought about the milk, just notice it like a wave and kind of have a sense of humor and smile and go back to your breathing. That's mindfulness. The, the difference is emotional brain training is really unique in that we didn't even know we could rewire our brain even 15 years ago. The part of the limbic brain, the brain behind the eyes, is actually plastic, which means that we can actually make changes in our brain. And the more we practice that I'm angry, that sad, that afraid, that guilty, that that is the way to access those emotions in the limbic or also known as the emotional brain, that rewires it. And so the brain hates change, but when you do it over and over and over again, it learns how to do something new and different that's healthier. And that's what makes emotional brain training so different. It's a different technique. I also use cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what you've all heard of as talk therapy. So then I find out what the issues are, then we move over to, okay, great, here's tools so that you can have these tools and run with them the rest of your life. No matter what stress happens to you, what bad news you get in life, you'll be able to use the tools to, to diminish and get rid of that stress. Does that make sense, the difference between mindfulness and emotional brain training? Yeah, actually, that, that was very helpful for me. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's nice to see how they work in tandem. And, and it seems that our attendee uh, thought so as well. Great, great. Um, I just want to finish the last few slides. There's not many more. And if there's any more questions, I can answer them at the other end. If we don't run out of time, is, does that sound good? That sounds great. Okay, perfect. So next steps, along with what we were just chatting about, how will you integrate your new skills into your life? And again, it's like going to a restaurant, you order an hors d'oeuvre, you can't really say you ate at that restaurant, you had an hors d'oeuvre, you didn't have dinner. So this was just an overview, okay? So, cause it's obviously more involved, but I just wanted to, you to know that this exists. So for next steps, do you wanna work on awareness of your body's reaction to stress? continue to learn more about emotional brain training, use tools to deal directly with stress rather than relying on 
food, alcohol, opioids, stimulants, technology, or other addictions for soothing, use tools to find balance, well-being, and ultimate joy in your life, and you can always follow up with me to work on addressing specific issues. Personal action plan. What did I learn or confirm from today's session? And considering your own triggers, we all have triggers, and sometimes you don't even know you're triggered until you're in a situation and you think, oh my God, I thought I dealt with that divorce 20 years ago or that feeling of self-doubt when I was 12 or whatever. Things have a way of sneaking back in. I was working with a new patient last week. She had a brand, she was so excited. She has a brand new job coming up. And um, she was all of a sudden feeling worried uh, that she couldn't do this work because she was triggered that someone had told her when she was young that unless you're perfect, don't even try something, just forget it. So it's, it's interesting how we think we've managed things and then we find out, oh wow, where did that come from? So consider my own triggers. How can I keep my own stress at a minimum? So this presentation, as I said, is an overview regarding what you can do when triggered with stress throughout the day. This talk has been about awareness that these skills and tools exist. Learning this program takes approximately seven one hour sessions, depending on the client, but you can have these skills for life. As Alexa said, I'm in private practice in the Denver area, but I do work with clients all over and you can feel free to contact me. And then this is contact information and I can always refer you to other therapists too that do emotional brain training uh, if you feel that that serves you best. And um, that is the end of my presentation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Cynthia. And just to wrap up, as we were talking about earlier, um, there are some upcoming events that we want you to be aware of. The uh, Small Business Workplace Wellbeing Workshop is happening on May 3rd that morning if you're in the Glenwood Springs area. And the May 15th Health Links webinar, um, a registration link will be sent soon, and that's about nurturing resilience with self-care. And then in June, we have a webinar planned um, regarding financial planning for women, which uh, can also be a huge source of stress, and we don't want it to be. But if you go to our events calendar at chwe.ucdenver.edu, you'll see the full list of everything coming up. And um, we urge you to stay connected with Health Links online, on Facebook, um, via Twitter, and uh, feel free to reach out to any of us that you've heard today. And I will send a follow-up email this afternoon that gives um, details about how to claim SHRM credits, how to review the, there'll be a link to review the slides you saw today, as well as an evaluation form. So um, stay tuned for that. So are there any last minute questions? I think, I think we're good. Well, thank you all again for joining us and we hope to see you in a future webinar. Take care, bye-bye.